Are you ready, Lindbergh? Uh-huh. Airfix? Yeah. Max? Okay. All right, modelers. Let's go. Well, hey everybody, Max of Max's Models here, and this is my face, Smolder. Okay, uh, I wanted to do a video on some updates, omissions, additions, and corrections. So I'll be looking off my iPad here, this is completely unrehearsed. So uh, let's uh, get rolling. Alright, updates. Uh, I'm currently working on uh, the Tamiya project and Arashima. I'm also getting some data for Renwall and Johan while well, I'm waiting on my postponed surgery due to the current unpleasantness. Omissions, things I left out that I wish I'd put in. Uh, also some oversights. Uh, slot cars. Uh, I've been getting reminded that I gave uh, both slot cars and model train short shrift, short shrift while uh, doing the uh, videos because I was focusing on the kits, but a lot of the kit makers did make both HO train sets, some were display and like monogram, and then others were actual working trains like Lindbergh and Ravel, and then of course also the slot cars. And I was surprised when I got into it. See, I played with slot cars as a kid in the, in the 60s, but uh, usually there were other people's sets or my brothers or something. I think most of them were Aurora, and uh, I never could master it. I sent most of them like a catapult ramp off the end of the table. I need to thank a YouTuber named Fast Sports. Uh, he reached out to me to help me with the uh, with the uh, slot cars, and he's a huge slot car guy. He's got us some really great videos. I recommend you check him out. He's a true, true, truly talented individual, and uh, he showed me some of the slot car companies that were also model kit companies I'd completely overlooked: Airfix, Strombecker, IMC, Renwall, Monogram, Ravel, Lenberg. And Cox, and although Cox wasn't really much of a kit maker, in fact, most of my involvement with Cox was uh, they're flying 049 powered and 020 powered model airplanes. But uh, apparently, once they started putting out slot cars, since they had the bodies and everything done, they went ahead and also released them as kits. Uh, another thing I wanted to uh, acknowledge was when I did the MPC project, I had a whole bunch of Space 1999 stuff set aside, and unfortunately, when I got working on the thing somehow that whole section got left out. Uh, I'll probably do a makeup video just for that. And uh, they actually made a lot of space type 1999 stuff, including a, uh, a nuclear waste dump, if you remember the pilot episode. Um, so apologies for that. that. That was a bad oversight on my part. Uh, I got a question about the nicknames. Uh, there were some nicknames that I forgot to mention that some friends of mine reminded me of, including Maximilian, duh. Uh, the Red Max, because I love flying, and of course, this is when the movie The Blue Max came out. And uh, occasionally, Max Effect, and one that I'd overlooked, which uh, I don't even know if they still make it, I think they're still around, Max Factor, since I'm not into women's cosmetics. Okay, anymore. Uh, but uh, additions, there are some, this is like emails I got from people that were really, I just thought they were interesting, so I thought I'd throw them in here. So I'm not gonna use the names because I don't wanna butcher them and I don't have their permission. So I'll just say this is from James. You know who you are, James. I used, uh, this is, I'm just reading his email. I used to live near AMT's Troy, Michigan facility on Maple Road back when MPC was in Mount Clemens, Michigan. The two companies would eagerly have press releases on the TV news every September, given the tiniest peaks of the new model cars from the Detroit Big Three. Often only the rear bumper of one or two of the cars. It was a very exciting time for a boy in the 60s and 70s. I have no doubt it was. I, I still get excited when I go to the car dealerships and see the new cars. Uh, another one from James, because uh, he grew up near some of these plants. Interesting side note. The AMT emergency vehicles, police cars, and fire trucks are actually reproductions of Troy, Michigan, and Utica, Michigan. Not Troy and Utica, New York, as some historians have suggested. AMT was on their Maple Road and Rochester Road, excuse me, AMT was on Maple Road and Rochester Road in Troy, and the research team drove to the fire station at Maple Road and John R. Road to garner photographic research details. The box art for the police car is a painting of I-75 crossing at Beaver Road. I just love that kind of trivia. Uh, 
This one's from uh, Steven. Uh, did anyone, and then it's going back to the nickname. Did anyone ever mention Big Max? Thank God no one ever put those two together. Okay. Uh, kind of don't know how. It seems pretty obvious, but hey, you know. I wasn't going to give it to them. Now, this is uh, one from someone in Canada, and it's about Aurora in Canada. Apparently, in 1968, Aurora licensed to produce the Enterprise at their Canadian plant for the Canadian market. They created the exact same box art, uh, now called the, the reissue retro box, except the AMT logo was replaced by a red square with the word Aurora in big letters across the box. I remember I had purchased and built both. The AMT kit sold for $2, but in Canada, the Aurora kit was, the AMT kit had sold for $2 in the USA, but the Aurora kit in Canada was $3.20, even though the Canadian exchange rate difference was only about 10 cents. I uh, purchased a lot of AMT kits. We always felt that we were being ripped off as we paid 60% more for a kit rather than 10% more. I agree, and I think that probably just because they had the lock on the market there and they did it because they could. That would just be my guess. Uh, still, we saved and built them. Okay, some corrections I need to make. Uh, AMT Star Trek model used in the Doomsday Machine episode of Star Trek was the USS Constellation, not the Constitution. I know that. I was, I was just checking to see if you were paying attention. It was a test. You passed. Relax. No, you caught me on that one. I actually think I had uh, written down Constellation and for some reason just said Constitution. Also, the name of the studio is pronounced Desilu, not Desilu. It's for Desi Arnaz and Lucille Ball. Uh, when I mentioned uh, Stephen Poe, the AMT representative wrote the book, uh, The Making of Star Trek, I pronounced it as Stefan, and several people who spell that name with the PH reminded me it's pronounced Stephen. From Donald. You mentioned about AMT seeing a Star Trek promo and becoming interested in possibly making the Starship Enterprise as one of their products in 1966. And he goes on to talk about the book, but principal filming of the episode The Cage, the first pilot, the one that didn't sell, was completed in 64, and the transporter was already established. Of course, that was a rejected pilot, and they made a second one. But he's right. The way that I mentioned it, it did sound... The way, the way I brought it out, the flow of information was wrong. Now, this is, as I understand it, I want to put that caveat out there, the entire issue with Roddenberry wanting a shuttle or landing the ship and all these other things that Desilu kept saying no to because of cost all transpired before the original pirate in 1964. That's why they came up with the transporter. Then in 66, when the show was going into regular series production and Roddenberry still wanted a shuttle, one reason was because he had some episodes he had written for the shuttlecraft that he wanted to make, like the later Galileo 7 and some others. This is when Steve Poe called and the timing was right to go ahead and get the shuttle prop made. So, correct. The entire disagreement about having the, the ship land or the shuttle made that led to the transporter took place before the 64 first pilot that was not picked up. And then in 66, after series production was getting ready, this is when they were approached by AMT and got their shuttle prop made by AMT. That's as I understand the timeline, but that's a, that's a good catch. Uh, Charles had my ass handed to me by the electric motor kit in Lindbergh when I was a kid several times. I'm a worthy opponent now. I, I just like that. <laughs> it's well put. Yeah, I've gotten a total of one to work for about 10 seconds. Uh, from Bill, I uh, look forward to info on MPC Earl. I'm assuming you have retired now. Have you ever thought about giving TED Talks at model shows, IPMS, Regionals, Nor'Eastern, BuffCon, or even coming to Canada, TorCon, HeritageCon? can almost guarantee to have an audience. Uh, I do have a regular job. I'm out on temporary until I get this surgery done, which again has been postponed. Uh, but I, uh, I do have a day job. That aside, though, if somebody invited me to give a talk, I would be delighted to. In fact, I might put together a 10 or 15 minute segment at some point on just what I would say if I was to give a TED talk. That, that would be great, though. That, that, I would love to do something like that because clearly I like to talk. Okay, this is Nigel, and I believe he's from the UK. What a surprise. Mattel did the same thing to the Corgi staff at Swansea, Wales, as they did at Monogram. But instead of moving their headquarters, as they did with Monogram, uh, they moved the manufacturing to China. Sad state of affairs. 
Um, I also used to own what I consider to have been one of the earliest plastic model kits, an RAF plane made in 1941 by Penguin, which ended up being owned by Triang. The Triang apparently became the largest toy manufacturer in the world for a while, but then uh, it went bust partly due to striking at the Meccano Dinky factory in Liverpool. Meccano was then taken over by Airfix, which was then forced out of business by a change of the market, and again by the workers at the Liverpool plant. At the Liverpool plant, their argument, we don't care about the parent company as long as we still have our jobs. The last Airfix ended up being made by Heller in France in the Russia's history. Yes, that is a uh, probably a very valuable model. And uh, I just finished putting some of these French molded kits, and they're very well made as opposed to the Indian Airfix of a Ford Escort that's not as good. So, note to there. Yep. Oh! I've just been informed it's lunchtime. My wife has made me a delicious bass, so I'll be back in a few. Don't go away now. Well, now that I've had my delicious bass, where was I? For the next two stories of the same person, T, you know who you are. Uh, wow, that was a surprise seeing Skokie on the fire truck. That dumpster at Lindbergh was our main stop, and I know the building on Monticello Street was there in the mid-50s, and for sure, possibly earlier. I uh, was born in 53 and always remember it being there. We lived in the middle of the 8200 block, and if you went past the next block, it was the second factory from the corner on the second block going south to Oakton Street. I remember those crappy you-put-together motors. However, they must have contracted with the Japanese company because later on they came already assembled. Uh, can you imagine growing up just a couple blocks away from a kit factory where they had an unguarded dumpster in the back where they threw out all the rejects. My shelf would have been full of those. I'd have slept in that thing. Now, here's a story that's a follow-on to that. This was on the uh, Lindbergh video. Since this is just a Lindbergh, Illinois, I'll share this. I was at the dumpster and opened up an airplane model box and was shocked to see the tip and another piece of a human finger. Well, they landed on the ground, and my friends and I poked them with a stick uh, and then hid them under a rock. And my dad was talking to a neighbor on the sidewalk when I rode, my, I rode up on my bike and told him, this is so 1950s. <laughs> I rode up on my bike and told my dad, and he said it was probably plastic. So the next day, I told my fifth grade teacher, and she said to bring them in. So we did, after school in a box with cotton. <laughs> <laughs> you just can't make this up. Can you imagine if a kid came in with a fingertip in a school today? He'd call out the National Guard. Uh, they immediately called the police. What had happened was a lady got them caught in the door of an injection molding machine before the days of OSHA. And uh, that's what they did to dispose of it. I wonder how many other human body parts are laying around in factory dumpsters across the country, especially in the 50s and 60s. Oh, Lord. <laughs> I got in trouble for being in the dumpster and, and I remember them saying something about we could get sued. Whatever that was. True story. And we continued going to the dumpsters for parts until we started chasing girls. Oh, God. You just can't buy memories like that. And the last thing, people have asked why the Round 2 uh, logo is a kangaroo. I actually reached out to Round 2. I'm waiting for a reply. Uh, my best guess, until I hear otherwise, would just be that, you know, since wearing boxing gloves, you know, boxing a kangaroo was a, a thing back at some time, maybe still is. And uh, my best guess is that uh, the boxing gloves indicate that these models are getting a, a second round, a second life. Like, you know, let's go round two. You had round one, let's do round two. Uh, that's totally a guess on my part. And uh, anyway, uh, guys, keep it coming. I'll get back to work. And uh, once again, thanks for watching. Really was a delicious bass.